Welcome everyone. We're so excited. Um, just a few notes so that you will know we are recording this and we are live streaming. So we're so excited to have everyone here. Um, we are going to get a little bit familiarized with the space and get to know each other on this session. Um, there are live captions available here on the live stream. So if you're joining us directly onto the Zoom, then you can find those closed captionings there. Otherwise, you can check that within your social media service. So um, why don't I go ahead and kick things off? So hi, everyone. Um, just a couple of technical things as we get started. So again, we're requiring that everyone who's not speaking, please make sure you are muted. Because of this, there actually may be some short breaks between the speakers as we go from muting and unmuting folks throughout the process. Um, again, we have closed captioning, which you can find on the bottom bar of the Zoom window. Um, again, we're recording and live streaming and Town Meeting TV is also going to be rebroadcasting it for you to be able to find on your local stations. But if you have any um, requests or anything that you need, please message Rights and Tem Democracy Tech Help. You'll see that as a selection of places that you can chat with directly um, if you have any questions. So good evening. We at Rights and Democracy. We like to start all of our events, including this incredible congressional forum, with a land acknowledgement. Rights and Democracy acknowledges the Mohican and Southern Vermont and Abenaki peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Indakina, which includes parts of Vermont, New Hampshire, New England, and Quebec. And as guests on the unceded territory of the Mohican and Abenaki peoples, we honor their ancestors, elders, and relations past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that our nation has benefited from the uncompensated and exploited labor represented in the legacy of slavery and the present day reality of migrant farm workers. So everyone, good evening. I'm glad that you're all here with us. My name is Kaya Morris and I'm the Executive Director for Rights and Democracy here in Vermont and in New Hampshire. So it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. We are excited to hear from the four candidates who are running in the Democratic primary for Vermont's sole seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. All right, now I know there's some people on the call tonight who are new to rights and democracy. So I do wanna make sure that you have some familiarity with who we are. So rights and democracy, which we call RAD for short. It was founded in 2015 on the theory of change that it takes people power year after year to make the kind of big, bold, long-term changes that we want to see in this country. And part of our theory of change is that it takes political infrastructure and in this case, a membership organization to sustain the momentum necessary to do that work throughout and in between elections. So RAD members and staff, they work on Karen. issues that matter to our communities. They organize for policy change at the state and national level. It says I don't have a speaker connected. And recruit and train a pipeline of progressive candidates to run for office. Now, our members are from all walks of life. They're intergenerational, they're multicultural, activists, artists, organizers, but most importantly, passionate fighters for true social justice and meaningful change in our communities and across the state. And our members choose the candidates that we will endorse, and they put time and energy in to help support those candidates. This is why this conversation is so important. So every election cycle, we have a membership vote, and we plan to hold our vote this year in June. One of our staff is going to support us by placing a link in the chat for any of you who are joining us via Zoom. And you can also find this link on social media later for any who would like to become a member and a part of our community. So this is what we know. Our current systems are deeply dysfunctional. They're rooted in historical oppressions and they're fragile. And when those fragile systems break, it's Vermonters who have been systemically kept out of places of power that are the most impacted. Abenaki and indigenous persons, racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA individuals, individuals with disabilities, senior citizens, new Americans in the migrant community, our youth, young adults, our poor and our working poor are the ones who carry the weight of policies and systems gone wrong. And these individuals are nearly 80% of the voting population in our state, yet the least represented in our government, and some cases wholly invisible to those who enact the policies that can prove deadly to their communities. And so that legacy has to end now from those who are seeking political power to earn our vote. But this relationship exists well beyond the voting booth. 
It's crucial that our candidates for Congress, within the relationship that you have to our state, that it has to move from being transactional to truly transformational if our democracy can continue to have meaning. Now understand, this is a mandate that we're going to vanguard today and into the future. Vermonters are suffering across the state and living with an uncertain future that is not sustainable. And whether it's our climate crisis to COVID-19, we have to do things differently, radically even, to get from the place of where we are into the world as we most want it to be. And I do want to recognize and celebrate the nomination and the confirmation of Justice Katanji Brown Jackson and our member staff and leaders who are there in DC lifting and supporting her journey for all of us. What is most salient in this moment, in this Women's History Month, is the recognition that women rising into places of decision making power is dangerous for the status quo. And that powerful, amazing energy that is going to be brought, that wisdom and that courage, that capability and that voice is going to be met with equal measure of opposition, denigration, and in some cases, harassment. I want you all to know that we are here for this fight and we are excited to have these women candidates that are here, that are hoping to make history here within Vermont. So we each work in pursuit of this government that reflects us and that works for all of us. So let's get to meeting the candidates. We have an incredible lineup today, so we're not going to be actually taking any questions from the audience, but we'll do our best to know any that appear within the chat. And if time allows, we may share it. So we are recording this event and we will post it to YouTube and Facebook afterwards. So we're fortunate to have the participation of four amazing candidates vying for the Democratic nomination for Vermont's congressional seat. So our participants tonight are in alphabetical order by name and also in the order for the question and answer portions. We have Senator Becca Ballant. We have Senator Keisha Rahm Hinsdale. We have Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray. And we have Sine Chase Clifford. So we're gonna begin with each candidate sharing their reasons for running and their vision for who they will be as Vermont's next congressperson. We'd love to hear from each of you. Senator Ballant, welcome. Thank you, Kaya, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, wonderful. I'm Becca Ballant. I live in Brattleboro with my spouse, Elizabeth, and our two children, Abe and Sarah. And the first thing that I want you to know about me is that I love people. And I bring that sense of connection to all that I do as a teacher, as a parent, as a strong progressive Democrat, as a coalition builder, and as an advocate for working people. I lead with honesty and integrity, and I'm deeply rooted in my values. That's how I've led as president of the Senate, that's how I will continue to lead if elected to serve you in Congress. Vermonters and Americans are facing immense challenges now. The stakes of this election are incredibly high. As you all know, democracy itself right now is at risk. So we need to protect voting rights. We need a Green New Deal. We need Medicare for all, but we also must make huge investments in mental health supports for our students, and we must address racial injustice that's been 400 years in the making. And what this moment requires is someone who has core progressive values, someone who really understands people, someone with the experience to get things done and to do the hard work in the quiet rooms. Do this work for Vermonters. Someone with integrity and commitment, someone who has delivered progressive change. And that's who I am, and that's why I'm running for Congress. And with the stakes as high as they are in this election, I think it's essential that you understand who I am as a leader. That comes from my experience of growing up as a gay kid at a time when society was incredibly hostile towards me. I was told that I was wrong. I was told that I was evil and that I should be ashamed of who I am. And it's a terrible feeling to not know if you can trust the people in your life that are supposed to have your back. And as a teacher, I recognize those feelings in my students who are also dealing with other issues, homelessness, neighbors, neighbors struggling to make ends meet, friends who couldn't afford healthcare. People want to know essentially that somebody has their back. And that's why I got into public service because I know what it's like to feel like nobody had my back. That's how I've approached my work as a Senator. And that's how I've worked in the State House to make sure that I have a progressive record that I have stood on and that I can prove to you that I've delivered on. I helped pass the largest housing investment in decades and I'm not done yet. We're gonna make more this year. 
first in the nation reproductive rights, Global Warming Solutions Act, protecting public um, employees' pensions. And I worked hard to pass the very first gun safety legislation in Vermont's history. I get things done because I know what it is to be a middle school teacher and I know what it is to be a parent. You can't survive teaching middle school if you don't believe that change is possible. And being a parent will absolutely eat you alive if you don't believe in the power of possibility and that each day is a new beginning and opportunity to try again. I hope to earn your votes and your support in the months to come. Please don't hesitate to reach out to my staff with questions or comments. My campaign has already had thousands of Vermonters on board doing this work together, and I hope that you will join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. I appreciate you. Senator Ram Hinsdale, welcome. Thank you so much, Director Morris. It's wonderful to see you. And as a proud member of Rights and Democracy, it was wonderful to see you polishing the crowns of other queens on the steps of the Supreme Court in the recent days. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, I also, you know, I know this is probably going to come up um, as we get deeper into questions from the community, but I do want to lift up the memory of Deborah Lisi Baker, uh, who we learned we lost yesterday, who was just an incredible activist and advocate, um, not just for people with disabilities, but for universal design for all of us. Um, and so I know a lot of people are hurting from her loss and I wanted to lift up her memory. She influenced me quite a bit. So I grew up uh, sweeping peanut shells off the floor in my Indian immigrant father and Jewish American mother's Irish pub. We were a working class family and uh, we pitched into the family business um, and met a lot of folks from all walks of life in the community. It was an incredible experience growing up, um, but it was one that, you know, where the American dream somewhat turned into the American nightmare for us. Um, my parents got divorced, we lost our house. Uh, my father, you know, moved us from a place that had ocean breezes to somewhere where the air was equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. And I know that made him feel like a failure as a parent. Um, later in his life, he kept working and he loved food service, but he also was masking the fact that he couldn't afford to retire. And ultimately my father died holding a catering tray in his hands at a Silicon Valley gala. So the fight for working people and the dignity of people to be able to retire is extremely personal uh, for me. As some folks know, I started in the legislature at the age of 22. I was a renter. I didn't have a car. I didn't have health care for those of us who remember the days uh, before the ACA when we could get kicked off our parents' health care. And that happened with some higher education budget cuts that my mother faced. And so, you know, I was knocking on doors and meeting my neighbors, knowing that if something happened to me while I crossed the street, um, then I would not know, you know, what would become of me and who would pay for it. Um, I, as folks can do the math, I started serving in the legislature during the free fall of the Great Recession, and I continue to serve in the Senate in the free fall of the pandemic, and I have fought for working families every step of the way. And too often in the Democratic Party, we're asked to choose between labor and organized labor and the needs of working people and being a good rank and file Democrat. And it's wrong. And it's something that's gotten me in trouble a lot in the party um, and something that I will continue to fight to do. As some of you know, I, I stood on the state house steps with our educators and our state employees when we were going to potentially cut their pensions in the darkness while they were out fighting to hold our communities together. Um, I, as some know, became a, the first woman of color in the state Senate um, the same day that the insurrection overtook the Capitol. So it's not lost on me that we live in two Americas and I have fought every day to make them one and ensure that our BIPOC communities and brown and black people are seen, heard and treated as they are Vermonters. I too am a Vermonter and I'm running for Congress to be your fighter for working families, our climate and our democracy. I am the only candidate with labor endorsements. I'm the only candidate endorsed by Bill McKibben and the local Sunrise Movement, Nina Turner, teachers like Jen Ellis who made Bernie's mittens and nurses like Mari Cordes, who goes straight from the ER to the halls of power in Montpelier. I am asking you to join this people powered movement and I would appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Hinsdale. Wonderful to hear from you, appreciate it. Um, Lieutenant Governor Gray, please join us. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Rights and Democracy. I believe this is the second forum of many to come in this historic uh, race for Vermont. I know we will be sending a woman to Washington, and I'm proud to stand here on the virtual stage tonight with three amazing candidates. Uh, welcome, Shanae. My service to Vermont started long before serving as your Lieutenant Governor. It started in 2006 when I graduated from the University of Vermont and helped elect Congressman Welch and then moved to Washington at 22 years old with my old Subaru and got to work uh, building his office from scratch. I was literally there when we opened the door to 1404, the Longworth House office building, building systems that would meet the needs of Vermonters. It was in 2007 when my younger brother, uh, graduated from Oxbow High School and was enlisted in the US Marine Corps. He enlisted and was deployed to Iraq. At that time, those initial reports of detainee abuse and torture at Guantanamo were coming to light along with the fallacy around weapons of mass destruction. So I went to work for the International Committee of the Red Cross, working with congressional committees and staff in the House and the Senate, uh, leading field missions into Uganda, Haiti, and other complex environments. I know what it's like to build an office from scratch and to work in Washington in the halls of Congress. I'll be ready to go on day one if elected your Congresswoman. I've also lived and worked across Vermont. I was born and raised in Newberry uh, where I grew up. I'm a proud product of our education system from kindergarten all the way through Vermont Law School. I live in Burlington today with my husband and two uh, step boys and when I was in law school, I lived in South Royalton, where I bartended at the Worthy Burger through law school. And when I was serving with the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, Rutland was my home. Um, as an assistant attorney general, I worked with communities around the state. And as your lieutenant governor, I've worked every day to give Vermonters a voice in Montpelier and also getting out around the state, trying to give um, our communities, uh, meeting them where they're at and engaging them personally. Throughout my career, I've also navigated some of the challenges that Vermonters face every day. Uh, working a second job to pay off student loan debt or to get through law school, trying to care for a loved one uh, without paid family and medical leave, renting numerous apartments, um, trying to deal with landlords and finding housing. I'm running for Congress because the challenges we face from our workforce shortage and our childcare crisis and our housing crisis will not be solved by Vermont alone. We'll need consistent, strong federal champions ready to fight every day for the needs of our state and also ready to bring our leadership on voting rights and reproductive rights and climate action to Washington where it's so sorely needed right now. I'm so delighted to be here tonight. I look forward to talking about the policies that I'll champion, answering your questions and hopefully earning your support. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for being here. Um, now I'd like to welcome Sine Chase Clifford. Hello, welcome. Hi, How, thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sine Chase Clifford, um, and I am so, so grateful to have all of this time with you all. And I look forward to hopefully having a future conversation with each and every one of you. Um, as I have started this journey, I hope that you all have heard a little bit of, about my about my background and who I am. And I'm excited to share um, some of the work and, uh, and experience I have that has brought me here as I answer some of your questions. But um, I would love to share, I would love to share a little bit about um, what this experience has been like for me so far. Um, as I've begun this journey, I've shared a vision for a policy that wraps communities in care and compassion and of sharing a vision of radical recentering of working families and a reimagining of what is possible from our government. Um, and in this past week, I've chatted with some folks who've told me, uh, sounds nice, but uh, don't bother. And actually, why don't, why not now? Why not know? Um, and I think some people feel particularly comfortable saying that to me because I'm a young black woman. And uh, I think sometimes when people see me, they have an assumption I need a lesson in how the world works. Um, but it's because that I 
do know incredibly well how how the world works that I understand the source of that disbelief of that pushback uh, against like no those those things aren't actually possible um because I know I'm not alone in the feel in in feeling deeply cynical and and heartbroken by lofty talking points and slogans that we throw around to win money and votes that overnight turn into excuses as to why all of those aims and ideals are unattainable and simply asking for too much. Um, because the reality is that there is an incredible gap between the values we are willing to say and the work we are willing to do to actualize those values. And I believe it takes someone who truly understands the human cost of that gap to actually do the work. You know, I grew up in Vermont as one of the far too many families that would not have been able to survive in a thousand dollar emergency. Um, I remember being 16 and driving around to Essex High School on fumes, um, playing lacrosse with holes in my sneakers, just praying for the, the small paycheck I got from working at the downtown mall um, because I knew I couldn't burden my, my parents with another ask. And you know, every semester I, I dodged calls from my university's debt collector about unpaid tuition while my friends covered me for meals I couldn't afford. These aren't abstract stories, this is my real life. And I know it exactly what's at stake for people like me, for families like mine, with every policy decision we make. And that is exactly why I'm running for Congress. Our next, our, our, our next member of Congress needs to be someone who will always choose our working families, no matter the pressure from leadership, no matter how hard the bill is to write. And we need leaders who every day will ask, how does this decision impact working families? Because as it stands, either no one's asking or the answer is not great. Um, we have to center the, the needs of our most vulnerable with uncompromisable values and tangible policy solutions that boldly address our structural challenges. And I'm so excited to be able to talk to you about some of those policy solutions as we engage with each other here tonight. Um, that certainly won't be easy, but I truly believe that together we can do things that seem impossible. So I'm honored to be here with you all tonight. And um, I am so excited to talk to you about how we can make these incredible ideas very much real and imaginable policy. So thank you. Oh, you're on mute. So exciting to um, heard of, from all of these candidates so far to get to knowing them a little bit better. And now is a wonderful opportunity where we're gonna get to hear from some of Rights and Democracy's members as they raise questions of importance to their lived experiences. So um, up first, we have um, joining us today, um, just so that you'll be aware, it's, this is the question and answer portion. So as a reminder for folks, each candidate's gonna have about two minutes to respond from our question from one of our members, a leader or an ally. We will be dropping the question into the chat for reference if needed. So RAD regularly works in collaboration and cooperation with many allies and communities. And so we'd like to start this question and period by opening up a space for one of those allies, Vermont Center for Independent Living. So I'd like to welcome Sarah Launderville, Executive Director of VCIL to speak about her work and to be able to ask a question to you all. Hello and welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much. Um, wanna make sure you can hear me okay. Um, thank you for um, having us today. Um, so my name is Sarah and I'm the director of the Vermont Center for Independent Living and we're a statewide organization um, made up, we're directed and staffed of people with disabilities. Um, and we work together for dignity, independence and civil rights. Some of our work, um, we provide peer to peer supports, home modifications, access to assistive technology, meals on wheels for people with disabilities under the age of 60, um, lots of advocacy work, technical assistance around disability laws and disability inclusion. And so there are many issues that come up around barriers around disability. Um, but for us, um, one of the most important is around employment and what we call the Social Security Disability Insurance Benefit Cliff. The cliff creates a huge and obvious disincentive to work. Typically, the response from politicians has been to study and to do continuous demonstration projects. And it's time to really reform the outdated practice around disability benefits so that people with disabilities can return to work without the loss of needed support. Uh, VCIL released a report last year and we found 
that there is a projected loss of 25,000 workers between 2010 and 2030. And at the same time as 2018, there are over 17,000 potential people with disabilities that help, can help meet that need. So our big question is, how will you support real reform that will help support workers with disabilities be in the workforce and finally address the social security benefit cliff? Thank you for that amazing question, Sarah. And we are so grateful for your work and your advocacy in our state. Thank you. Um, so up first, we'd love to welcome Lieutenant Gray to um, respond to the question. Thank you. It has been placed in the um, chat as well if you need to have it. Available. Thank you, Kaya. And I just want to thank Sarah and thank BCIL for your incredible work um, throughout the pandemic. The report that you championed is so helpful. And I actually wanted to bring up some of the data. I think it's 43,000 Vermonters with disabilities are working age 18 to 64, but only half of them work full time or part time, leaving over 20,000 Vermonters on the sidelines. This means that there's an exclusion of the full ability to participate in our economy. It's a lack of economic secu uh, security. Also, the lack of ability to fully have a livelihood and engage um, in the way that so many Vermonters do in our communities every single day. Right now, um, without any action on the Social Security T Trust Fund, it's expected to go bankrupt by 2034. So I think first and foremost, as a member of Congress, I would advocate and work to support uh, extension of and full funding of the Social Security Trust Fund. We absolutely have to reform SSI and SSDI benefits to remove the benefits clip so to make sure that um, all Vermonters are able, especially those who are facing the benefits clip day in and day out, are fully able to participate in our workforce. Um, this is deeply personal to me. It's something I care about. Um, my mother uh, does um, live each day with a disability and I want her and I want um, all of our Vermonters to be able to engage fully in our communities and our workforce. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. Appreciate that response. Um, up next, I would like to ask, um, I apologize. I think I went out of order. I do apologize. Um, Senator Rahm Hinsdale. No, no worries. Um, so I first, you know, just want to acknowledge um, Sarah was the one who I know was busy yesterday sharing news and consoling folks around the loss of Deborah Lisi Baker. So thank you, Sarah, for being here today, knowing that that's what you spent yesterday uh, doing. For those of you who may not know, um, you know, we had our one of our favorite rad endorsed state representatives, uh, Representative Taylor Small on the House floor today, um, working on a reach up bill that gets rid of the re work requirement to be a part of the reach up program. These are the kinds of changes we fought for for so long so that you're not punished for starting to go back into the workplace, but you're also not punished for not being able to make the choice to work. I fought this year in terms of unemployment benefits for folks um, to ensure that we didn't have a work search requirement and to provide more resources for people on unemployment with dependents. Um, so I believe in universal basic income and creating pilot programs to help working parents um, and, and new parents ensure that they can uh, get ahead in accessing higher education or you know, simply making sure they bond with their newborn or um, take care of a chronic illness rather than feel like they have to work. And then of course, as someone who served on Ways and Means, I have put forward proposal after proposal to try and slope our benefits cliff uh, to make sure that we have stair steps for people to walk off of benefits into a stable path to the middle class. Um, you know, without worrying that they will lose access to childcare, lose access to healthcare, and lose access to benefits that they need um, to take care of people, their, their own disability, a family member with a disability. Um, you know, we have heard as well that there are so many folks with, uh, with long-term care needs for themselves or a family member who have gone bankrupt trying to take care of those needs. Um, I stand with people with disabilities in struggles for a community and a society that often was not designed for them um, and for benefits that are not made for them to experience dignity, and we need to work to end that. Thank you very much, Senator Hinstel. Um, Sine. Hi. 
Thank you so much, Sarah, for the question and your work. Um, this, I mean, our social safety net as it stands is hardly a net. It's uh, more akin to barbed wire. It might catch you, but it's gonna hurt and you better not move around too much. Um, you know, I, this, I am called to think about um, section 14C certificates and the subminimum wage for folks who have disabilities. And I'm incredibly proud that Vermont has led the nation in phasing those certificates out, but there is still no federal floor for how little folks with disabilities can be paid. And, and as it stands, our federal, minimum, federal and state minimum wage um, isn't livable for anybody. Um, and so we need to think about how those decisions deprive folks of financial independence, of wealth building capacity, and the full value of their contributions in the workplace. And, and I share that because there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of similarities in, in the justification of that legislation um, with what we see in supplemental security income and social security disability insurance. This idea that um, in the assumptions about the capacity of work and the value of folks who are disabled in the workplace. And it illustrates the, you know, the entire problem of our income support system. It treats people who need support as fundamentally bad and as not as folks who need truly support and a real caring soft net that'll help folks find their way and and be able to find a livelihood and be able to build a life for themselves um, but instead we have a system that assumes people will you know add in every shape and form try to game the system so it's an incredible example of why we need care and compassion and everything that we do um, and I think that takes real it's gonna oh I'm I'm getting the hot fire flames here, but it's going to take really looking through this entirely massive legislation, but also making sure folks who have actually lived on SSI and SSDI are at the table working through legislators on how we can, at every step of the way, make sure we're seeing people with humanity in our policy. Thank you for that. And just for those that are in the Zoom room, I, the emojis I'm throwing up are in support of us, keeping track of time so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak equally. Um, I'd love to welcome Senator Ballant. Sorry, I'm having some connectivity issues, okay? Okay. So first and foremost, I wanna say people with disabilities should not be penalized for trying to get back to work. And we need to change structures at the federal level so this doesn't happen. And as Sarah said in her introduction, it's been talked about and talked about and such little action has been taken. We have to raise the SSDI thresholds for all individuals, index it to inflation and institute a phase out so there isn't a dramatic drop off. Work, we all know, and I've seen it in my students, work can be a real form of healing and students with disabilities want what we all want. They want meaningful work. They wanna be able to keep that meaningful work and not be penalized for working longer hours and earning an income. Fear of losing SSDI and SSI benefits is a significant barrier to employment for folks with disabilities. Congress, ha Congress has enacted uh, many social you know, security work incentive programs to make it possible for people to work without losing benefits, but they're complicated and they're not easily understood or accessed. We have to simplify and streamline the process. And Congress needs to seriously consider a real benefit offset or another strategy that will enable SSI, SSDI recipients to work expanding, expanded hours. And as I said, Congress needs to act. There's been too much talk, not enough action. We have to explore other benefits related strategies that will expand employment opportunities for people with disabilities, such as a more robust national Medicaid buy-in program. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. 
Um, very grateful for um, the conversation so far. I do want to just remind folks as we're moving forward with time that um, we are not taking questions from the audience. Um, those who are joining us to ask these questions have been invited as members of Rights and Democracy and those who have been deeply involved in our work and in our um, have been supportive of the movement as a whole. So um, I think they bring a really rich body of questions that are really thought provoking and important for us to consider as we determine who we feel is going to earn our votes to become the next um, our next representative in Congress. So thank you all for that, just to clarify one more time. Um, so now we're going to move on to another question, which comes from a member leader, ourself, that we're very excited about, Matthew LaFleur. Matthew, can you join us? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, legislators, officials. Thank you, everyone in the you know Zoom world. Uh, yes, I do have those questions. Let me bring it up so, you know, I don't forget them, but yeah. Wonderful. Can My you tell us? For, yeah, I'm going to tell you about myself. Yes, we'd love yes. to know a little bit about you, Matthew. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Matthew LaFleur. I'm actually from Auburn, Vermont. I'm a volunteer early educator teacher and a Let's Go Kids advocate activist serving Franklin and Grand Isle County and a local board member. My, my question to the panel is, how will you achieve our Vermont goals of accessibility throughout government and accountability within Vermont social services, healthcare services, and the services we provide for citizens, youth, seniors, veterans of all forms of mobility or disabilities? And how can we achieve these goals together, knowing the system in place we have currently is discriminatory or discrimination and has limited accessibility and does not have equity for all in mind? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. We appreciate your question. Um, so I believe we're going to start this time with Sine. Welcome. Great. Um, thank you so much for an incredibly thoughtful, an incredibly thoughtful question. Um, I have in a in a in a previous job, I worked in this city hall plaza project. It was this entire redesign of a city hall plaza, and um, it was you know very flashily done and, and well paid for, etc. Um, and I was somehow tapped to sit in the room with with folks um, as as a social worker, not quite sure how I ended up in this very constructed or construction oriented space, but very glad that I did because as as we talked about the design project and this is again for a city building, um, it became very clear that they hadn't talked to a single person who was living with a disability in the design of the space and when I brought this up about, you know, how, how do you know that this is actually going to serve folks and actually be a people's plaza as, as these spaces should be, I was told, you know, the people who are making the decisions are in this room, so it doesn't really matter. And that happens in far too many rooms, in far too many decisions. And in response, I created a public engagement initiative around, around what seems, what can seem trivial for some, but is incredibly important to how folks engage with their government and engage with their services. So I was able to talk to folks who, who said, you know what, actually that, that ramp is far too long. And if you're using a manual wheelchair, you'll, you'll never be able to get up it. Or, you know, actually the spacing of that cobblestone doesn't make sense for my, for my stroller with my child. And thinking about in everything that we do, how we can be responsive to the totality of folks' lives and not just assume what people's experiences are, I think is a way that we can get at um, what is an incredible challenge of systemic discrimination in our policy. And I, and I think of that too um, in a more specific policy oriented way as you know addressing our long term care crisis for folks with disabilities and thinking about investments in home and community based services because it's incredibly important that folks are able to maintain independence and are able to choose the circumstances of their care and how they live um, you know we've seen reduced capacity uh, of, of facilities and, and closure and 
Um, it's incredibly important to me that we see HCBS required under Medicaid as institutional services already are. So again, that folks with disabilities can afford a plethora of care options and also can have agency and autonomy over their care. Um, the last thing I'll say here is that my mom has been a direct care provider um, for, for many, many years. And as I was growing up, she worked three jobs and I barely saw her in high school um, because we also need to make incredible investments in our care economy and our care workers, because that's also how we support folks with disabilities so that can have a full and meaningful life. And we need to support the people who buttress that ability um, and make sure that they have union protections, they have incredible pay, and that they also have advancement opportunities and are protected from racism and discrimination and xenophobia in their workplace as well. So an incredible question. Hope I've tackled some of those, some of your really thoughtful ref reflections. Thank you for that. Um, Senator Ballant. Okay, can you hear me? I'm having all kinds of problems. I keep getting a sign saying that my internet is unstable. So I apologize, Kaya. All right, so where I wanna start is this. Our society is only truly democratic if people have the opportunity to access and participate fully. So there are so many aspects of the question and I wanna make sure that I get to all of them. So first and foremost, we need affordable, comprehensive health care, including home health care and mental health care. Our bodies do not end at our necks. They don't end at our necks, and yet we continue to operate our health care system as if it does. We need absolute access uh, to the ballot box with mail-in voting, early voting, exposing, expanding voting hours, making Election Day a federal holiday, making sure everybody who wants to be part of the democratic process can get to the polls, not just for the general, but for all the primaries as well. We have to make government proceedings and participation available virtually um, and accessible to folks, with virtual, you know, to folks with disabilities. I've worked to make my own campaign accessible, whether that's providing captions, using plain language, alt text on social media, or providing a sign language interpreter at our events. And so if you have more uh, recommendations, I'm eager to hear them. And under my leadership, we have worked very hard to make the legislature and the legislative process much more accessible to Vermonters. And I hope long after the pandemic, these things will still be in place so that you can see what we're doing in the halls of power from your own you know, rooms at home. That you don't have to drive like my constituents do two hours up to the state house, sit in the hallway and maybe not even get called to testify. The other thing I wanna mention is that we changed the process for engagement of Vermonters this year in trying to figure out how we should spend these ARPA dollars. We made sure that we could access the opinions of Vermonters across the state. And then we met with 1400 Vermonters to get their feedback on how to spend those dollars. And when we didn't quite get it right, we met with smaller groups again to say, what did we get wrong? What are we missing? We have to continue to be refining these processes to make sure people actually feel like their voices are represented in the final document. And so, there's so much to so much that we can do at the federal level to do uh, the work of uh, passing laws that are more fair. But if people don't have access to the lawmaking, if people don't have access to how the bills are crafted, then that's not true justice. Thank you very much for that, Senator Ballant. Much appreciated. Um, up next, we have Senator Hinsdale. Thanks so much, Kaya. Um, so from my work both in city government in the city of Burlington uh, to working in the state house in Montpelier and co-chairing the social equity caucus, uh, access to the procedural justice and actual justice that people deserve in the form of outcomes has been near and dear to my heart for a long time. And I want to share a story from when I uh, was the staff person supporting our Burlington Accessibility Committee. First of all, I, I walked into a situation where a lot of advocates and leaders from the community of people with disabilities were really frustrated and disappointed and said, we have this group, we try to meet and there's no support and there's, we're, we're just really marginalized in the city. And we, one of the things that was really important to me was to make sure that we had people return 
to the meetings when they heard a concern and share the outcome of what happened and help people show that their advocacy was working in real time. I don't think it was a very high bar, but I was very grateful for that the Vermont Center for Independent Living gave us uh, an award for during the uh, 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I remember preparing for months for that event because it was down at North Beach. We had just created uh, an accessible uh, ramp or mat down to the water, uh, but that truly wasn't enough. And I kept looking around and saying, what would happen to a person in a wheelchair if they tried to sit at the picnic table, for example? They wouldn't be able to put their food on the table and get close enough to the table and enjoy it. And I said this to a member of the park staff, you know, who just, I didn't know how much he was sort of paying attention. I was just frantically telling him what I thought was concerning to me. And I came back a few days later and he said, hey, Keisha, I just sawed off the end of the table so that someone in a wheelchair could roll right up to the table and sit down and they wouldn't need to worry about the bench being in the way. And I just thought, you know, thank you. I mean, this man literally is giving people a seat at the table. Um, and it's something that we don't always have to wait to engage people and to, you know, have the right policies in place. Sometimes we need to just act and we need to just create space. And that's the work that I've tried to do both in my role in local government and in state government, um, you know, just ensure that we have police who are trained in how to slow down and de-escalate a situation, have a playground that's accessible to everyone from, you know, young kids to seniors wanting a place to recreate or take their grandchildren. And when we do those kinds of things, we realize that it makes society work better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your thoughtful questions. Um, Lieutenant Gray, it's a governor, sorry, Gray. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Matthew, it's a wonderful question. Um, I think every day when I go to the state house and enter my office um, about loved ones or individuals who might wanna come for a visit, might wanna come up and see Senate proceedings and what would it be like to try to enter the only area of the state house that's disability accessible and then come up to the Senate to watch a proceeding. But what if you have to use the bathroom and then go all the way back across the state house to use a bathroom? And the um, inadequacy today of so many of our government spaces um, and the inability for them to be accessed by Vermonters fully. I think it's so important, not only in how we run our campaigns, and how we think about where we host events, how we host events, whether it's closed captioning, um, whether they're fully accessible, but also where do we have our offices and how are Vermonters able to ex access them when they're, they have a social security benefit or concern um, or if they need access to a veterans benefit, is it by phone, is it by email, is it by Zoom? Um, there are opportunities every day right now for us to make these changes throughout the way that government exists and the way that government should exist. My commitment as a human rights lawyer, as someone who has engaged each day with a loved one with a disability is that um, we have to do this work. Um, we have to think about this and how we set up our offices and how we make sure that government um, is fully serving the people that we serve. And for me, that comes back to again and again, making sure that we have constituent services and a real plan to support all of the Vermonters in our communities of all abilities and disabilities. Um, so again, I just wanna thank Matthew for this question. It's an incredibly important one. And I hope we're thinking about it, not only today and how we're running our campaigns, but most certainly I'll be thinking about it in running a fully accessible um, office as Vermont's Congresswoman. Thank you so much. And thank you, Matthew, for your great work. Um, so exciting to have this conversation and to lift up these voices. Um, so next, I'm excited to invite um, Winooski resident and renter Lisa Black with a specific question around housing. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. And thank you for the privilege of asking you all a question. My name is Lisa Black, and I worked as an emergency room physician assistant for 25 years. After undergoing 15 surgeries in six years, I became disabled in 2016. Over the last 10 months, I formally requested that my landlord, Redstone Properties, a Vermont-based mega landlord, 
make my apartment ADA accessible and that they fix multiple issues that are in violation of general building codes. These requests have been denied or fixed without care and with great delay, either creating new violations or not properly addressing the previous issue. I filed complaints against their actions and I asked for assistance from my municipality, but this has not stopped my landlord from serving me an eviction notice for no cause. We are currently experiencing a nationwide housing crisis that is particularly acute in Vermont. And unless I can find suitable housing in this environment, I will become homeless in May. What would you do to hold landlords accountable to ADA standards and ensure that all Vermonters are able to live in safe, healthy and accessible living conditions without risk of eviction? Thank you so much, Lisa, for your incredible question and your thoughtful sharing of your story. Um, so we'll begin first with Lieutenant Governor Gray. I think we have, as was mentioned earlier, 93,000 Vermonters living with disabilities and about half have an ambulatory disability. We know we've talked about it um, again and again and again. We have a massive housing crisis in the state. The amount of open rental properties is extremely limited. Our vacancy rate is um, extremely low right now. And what I see as one of the greatest priorities is one, making sure that housing is fully accessible. Again, I know what it's like to try to find an apartment. I've rented um, more than 17 in my life uh, where a loved one can come visit and, and not have to go up four flights of stairs or a flight of stairs and the bathroom is fully accessible. It's extremely hard, not only in Chittenden County, but in counties across the state. So one, we need to make sure that we're investing in supporting landlords and making sure that housing is fully um, ADA accessible. Two, we also have to invest in enforcement. Um, housing, re housing related violations are reported through HUD's FHOE, the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. It's an office that's not even fully staffed right now. So if elected, I would work to ensure the office is fully staffed. Um, they have the full, full authorization support and also appropriation support of Congress. And they have the full power to enforce um, ADA regulations. But I think the other important piece is that we need to crack down on evictions. Um, Senator Bennett's Eviction Crisis Act would fund local governments to create landlord tenant community courts and increase social services for tenants. We have to have um, local accountability, making sure that individuals with disabilities are not evicted anywhere in Vermont and then making sure that we can keep individuals in homes in the limited amount of housing that we have while we continue to build more um, across the state. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Um, so up next, I wanna also make a correction because I think it's important for us to honor each other both in the pronouns that we choose to use and in our given names, our chosen names. These, this is how we want our names to be said. And so um, our next person to answer this question will be actually Shanae. Um, and I've been mispronouncing um, your name this whole time. And as somebody with a name that everybody mispronounces, I feel it's important to honor your your chosen name in the way that you want to hear it. So, um, Shanae, please. I, I very, I very much appreciate it. Um, and also, I guess, because it does happen all the time, it's, I, I, I feel it heartfelt, but also it's all right. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for your, your vulnerability, um, in sharing this so that we can have this conversation, but beyond all of our answers, I am incredibly sorry that this is happening to you and it is in completely unacceptable. And I I am sure, um, well, you know, I think I know that you have people in your corner who are working to help you, but please let me know if there's anything I can do to support you in what is an incredibly traumatic time. Um, because I've I've worked with, with folks, um, unfortunately, who are, who've been on the brink of eviction and losing her housing while I was getting my master's in social work. I worked in a emergency financial services center. And I remember one person I worked with, um, I, I'll, I'll call her Miranda for this, for our conversation. Um, 
was on was on the brink of eviction because you know similar to our conversation about uh, benefits cliffs earlier had gotten a new job didn't file it in time and was um, was called out for fraud in her voucher and tried to appeal this fraud ruling and unfortunately was unable to and was on the verge of losing the, um, their housing and you know I sat with her while she asked those terrifying questions about where am I going to live. Where are my kids going to, how are my kids going to be able to get to school? Where are they going to shower? How are they going to eat? And I've been that go-between between between housing authorities and landlords and, and people who are on the verge of losing their housing. And, you know, people unfortunately only see a non-payment and don't see a person who's facing unconscionable choices and the trauma of eviction and not even of just the eviction, but also the threat of eviction and the threat of losing your your housing stays with you and manifests in every aspect of your life. And so as long as our housing crisis persists, we are also going to have to deal with a trauma crisis. And that is why codifying and upholding a series of rights that is housing would be would be my utmost priority. Um, just really quickly, there's so many things I want to say about housing all the time, but Paramount, I think, to your question, Lisa, is we need to establish a national right to counsel and eviction proceedings, establishing a national fund for both tenant legal representation and housing ap- advocates, in addition to codifying a tenant bill of rights, would help ensure that folks like you could stand up to your landlord and have the so necessary support you need without fear of retribution. Thank you very much. Appreciate your answers and responses. Um, Senator ballot. Okay, there we go. Housing is the key to healthier people, healthier communities. We know this, uh, we give lip service to it, but we need to invest like we really mean it. So the federal government needs to invest in a high quality and affordable housing and we need to push Congress to ensure increased access to justice for renters. I spent the past eight years in the Senate fighting to build more housing. And that's because I know whether it's our workforce challenges, whether it's dramatic income disparity, ongoing mental health crises, homelessness, our statewide struggles with the opioid epidemic, housing is always at the center of the solution. And it's clear that affordable high quality housing can provide stability and hope and safety. And it can be a base from which all of us can build a better life. So how do we ensure that everybody has access? First, we need to push for federal just cause eviction standards. We need to strengthen and expand the Fair Housing Act and pass the Equality Act to include LGBTQ plus Americans in the Fair Housing Act, long overdue. We need to give the Justice Department the funds, the resources, and the tools to actually enforce the law making the building codes actually mean something. Because without enforcement, all of the rules, all of the regulations amount to nothing. We also have to enforce accessibility requirements and ensure that zoning and land use restrictions are not used to prevent Americans with disabilities from making appropriate residential choices for themselves. Civil rights division must be given the resources to truly prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities. And in a broader sense, we have to push for a civil Gideon, guaranteeing legal representation in civil litigation, because we know that so many people, so many people do not have access to any representation in eviction cases, and that's why they lose their housing. The other thing that I'm keen on, and I really want us to think about investing at the federal level is block grants for housing first models. We know housing first works. We know low barriers to housing works. We should be leaning into things that work and not trying to reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, And um, finally, um, I would like, oops, I lost track of my notes. I apologize. (laughs) My notes scrolled ahead of me. Thank you so much. So um, up next is uh, Senator Ram Hinsdale. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Um, Lisa, I want to add my uh, apologies and deep concern for your situation um, and express that if there's anything I can do to help, I am here as your state senator. Uh, I was just 
in Winooski a couple weeks ago with some of the 25 families that were in danger of eviction from the Bove's property um, and the pro bono lawyer who is working to help them since we know legal access is an issue. And we're very grateful that there is a resolution in that case, but it just shows uh, how much we things hang in the balance for tenants, even when they're doing everything that they can. And um, you know how concerning it is that we still have no cause eviction on, on the table. Uh, I've been a champion for just cause eviction in the Senate. I really hope in a nonpartisan way, Tom Proctor can help you, <laughs> um, you know, understand that. I have worked um, both on the House side and in the Senate side to fight off any unfortunate amendments that would create carve outs. And Lisa, your story helps us know and remember, as we hear from landlords saying, but we're trying to do the right thing too, that it's so often women and people of color uh, who face this situation. And that is incredibly unjust. Um, when I was a renter myself in Burlington, um, I had a landlord who tried to keep the majority of my security deposit for unjust reasons. And I had the wherewithal as a college sophomore to go to the housing review board and fight to get my security deposit back. Um, my other colleagues, you know, my housemates gave up and said, I don't have time to do that. I don't really understand how the process works. When I became a new legislator, I looked around on the housing committee and I was the only tenant, the only renter on the housing committee. Um, the first bill I ever passed actually was a change to the national commercial code around carving security deposit returns out of what is considered a uh, consensual transaction when you deposit a check. So what that means in, in less nerdy language is that when you cash a portion of a security deposit, you're often foregoing your ability to argue for the rest. And I was able to carve out the commercial code to say that you can still go to court and argue for that remainder so you don't have to hold on to that check. People need that money. I grew up in a family where we paid rent, we paid utilities, and whatever was left over was what paid for groceries. And I absolutely hear you. I continue to fight for just cause eviction, for tenants' rights. And I don't want to leave out that the housing bill that I authored that's coming to the floor this week has protections and resources for mobile home park residents. We can't leave them out of the conversation about ha habitability, safety, and stability. Thank you all. This is a really important conversation that is definitely, um, I think, giving us some thoughts on what we will need um, moving forward for a brighter future. So I'm excited now to welcome our community leader and Catalyst Leadership cohort member, Deborah Davis. Hello, Deborah. I am here. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good, good. So my name is Deborah Davis. I am a student at the Community College of Vermont. I'm raising my 12-year-old granddaughter in Burlington, and I'm interested to know your support, to know if you support the dissolution of the Electoral College. I really want my children and grandchildren to live in a direct democracy that values every, every citizen's vote. As a congressperson, what would your plan be to ensure that voting rights and fair elections are protected across the country? For you, does this include in dissolving the Electoral College? Why or why not? Thank you for your question, um, Deborah. Much appreciated. Um, we'll begin with uh, Senator Ballant. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the question. And I'll just start and put it out there. Yes, yes, please. Let's get rid of the Electoral College. It's undemocratic and makes some Americans' votes less impactful than others. We all know, <laughs> we all know it is not a fair system. It does not serve us well. So yes, that's a simple one for me. Uh, in terms of voting, like Vermont has been a real model in the nation when it comes to access to the ballot box. And the right to vote is the fundamental civil right from which all other rights flow. And I just wanna say, you know, make no mistake, Republicans in Washington and across this nation in legislatures across the country are supporting voter suppression laws. Over 400 restrictive voting laws were introduced in state houses across the country in the last year. These laws disproportionately impact communities of color, people with disabilities, seniors, people living below the poverty line. And we know that this is intentional. Republicans think that if more people vote, they will lose. 
So they're attempting to make it harder and harder to vote. It's the same reason why they wanna keep the electoral college system. It's the same reason. It is that they do not want people to actually be represented. So here's what I would do in Congress. I'd support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would restore and improve the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was gutted by the Supreme Court. I would support for the People Act, which would, among other things, secure automatic voter registration and allow mail-in voting. And we have to get big money out of politics. I can tell you, let's pull the curtain back. Let's pull the curtain back for a minute. What all of us are doing right now, we're all on the freaking phone for hours a day trying to raise money for our campaigns. It's broken. It's fundamentally broken. So let's stop pretending that it's not. True. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Rom Hinsdale, thank you. Your response. So I'm someone who's always been keenly aware that others uh, lost opportunity and in some cases lost their lives for my right to vote and my ability to lead and serve. That has never been lost on me and it's why I have run for office and turned around and worked to help others run for office as well. We can't forget that it's important we have voting rights and it's also important we have candidates who are working for the people who are reflective of our full citizenry, residency and democracy. And uh, that's why I helped found Emerge Vermont and the Bright Leadership Institute, uh, which helps candidates of color run for office and was a partnership with Rights and Democracy and the Catalyst Leadership Program. Um, because we also know that representation matters as well. It's a very interesting question because I was actually the first and only woman of color in Vermont to serve in the Electoral College, um, to cast a ballot in this last election. And I kept saying, I am really honored to be the first, but I also hope I am the last. It's one of those cases where I usually don't want to be the first and the last. Um, but we know that in if you're in California, and you're a member of the Electoral College, you represent about 700,000 people. And if you're a, an Electoral College member in Vermont, you represent 200,000 people. Um, it's patently unfair. And I actually talked to a lot of Electoral College experts during the time that I was uh, a, a member of the Electoral College. Many of them are most worried about harassment and uh, members of the Electoral College changing their vote. I think that is the biggest concern that we're facing in the next election is a stolen election, whether it's at the ballot box um, or keeping people from the ballot box or it's at the level of the Electoral College. Um, and so we have to make sure reforms are in place first and then we need to work to abolish, abolish the Electoral College because the concern right now is grave that this uh, upcoming election will be stolen. I'm someone who's championed all resident voting so that anyone in a community can vote in their local elections, rank choice voting to make sure that candidates have the full choice they need and deserve in their democracy and access to the ballot box by mail so that people for whatever reason, working folks, people who can't get to the polling places, um, you know, people with disabilities can vote in comfort and convenience and we should be making access to the ballot box safer and easier, not harder. Thank you for that, Senator Rom Hinsdale. Um, up next, um, I'd love to hear your response, um, Lieutenant Governor Gray. Thank you, Kaya. And Deborah, thank you so much for this question. Uh, I do support dissolving the Electoral College, but I think it's important to recognize what that would take, uh, constitutional amendment, and that there are steps right now that can be taken. Vermont's taken some of them. We've um, joined the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. I think we have to get to 270 electoral votes. We're at 193 now. So that's an important step in making sure that um, each state's electoral votes go to the winner of the national, national popular vote. But day in and day out across the state, as was mentioned tonight, as we're talking um, about every single day, Republicans are attacking the right to vote. In Texas right now, it is now illegal to send a ballot application uh, for a, send an application for a mail-in ballot. In Montana, it's now um, uh, impossible to do same-day registration, which for a lot of young people, that is incredibly, incredibly um, discriminatory. And as a human rights lawyer, as a Vermonter, um, as 
someone who cares deeply about access to the ballot box, I would absolutely support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. I believe strongly that we need a federal national holiday so that no individual has to choose between picking up their kids or getting to work and the ability to vote. Um, no one should have to choose between uh, voting by mail or voting in person. Voting by mail should be part of our elections moving forward everywhere. And same day registration has to be available to people across this country. So bottom line, we're in the fight of our lives and voting rights are under attack. Who we send to Washington matters and we have to keep fighting each and every day to preserve our democracy and preserve the right to vote. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor Shanae. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yes, abolish the Electoral College, full, full stop. Um, I think there's also a lot of research and, and voices that actually, you know, show that it does a disservice to small states. I remember being a student in, in AP Gov uh, and learning about the Electoral College and like, oh, it's great for small states, but it's actually um, doesn't pan out like that for anything. It does a tremendous disservice to our votes in Vermont as, as a smaller state. Um, so yes, uh, dissolve the Electoral College um, and it should be as easy to vote and anywhere as it is in as it is in Vermont. So same day and automatic voter registration, voting rights for people who are incarcerated everywhere. Um, and we we have to go further to ensure an unencumbered right to vote. So that absolutely includes passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and HR1, the For the People Act. And and we know also ensuring fair and functional elections doesn't just stop once you get to the ballot box, it also matters how folks get on onto the ballot in the first place. So thinking about provisions included in the For the People Act, like small dollar donor matching to empower candidates who are focused on small donors and who are focused on everyday working people. Uh, thinking about ranked choice voting, not just thinking about it, making it a reality. Uh, ranked choice voting is essential to making sure that the best candidate wins, not just the most connected candidate or the candidate with the most resources at their disposal. So folks can actually have a real choice in who they and who they want to see represent them. You know, we often tell, I think, people who would be incredible candidates and stewards of our democracy that that they shouldn't run um, because of all of all of the odds. But it's also incredibly important we think about legislation that supports really robust candidate recruitment and allows as many people to run as as who wants to, because that's really how we get really robust conversations about who gets to be our representation and who gets to steward our democracy. Um, yeah, full stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so next, we're going to breathe a little life into this room here, and we're very excited to welcome youth leader Addie Lentzner. Addie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be in this space with you all. Um, so my name is Addie Lentzner. I'm a high school senior from Arlington Memorial High School. I'm part of the Vermont Student Anti-Racism Network, and I do a lot of work around anti-racism in the state. Um, I'm also part of the End Homelessness Vermont Coalition, and I help to advocate to extend the GA Motel program for Vermonters experiencing homelessness. So my question for our four amazing candidates is, um, what is your plan to address years of racial inequity, including the legacy of redlining, the school to prison pipeline, health inequities, and other forms of systemic racism? And basically, do you have a plan for how you're going to address the effects of all of these forms of systemic racism? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Addie. Um, to start us off, Senator Ram Hinsdale. Thank you so much, Kaya. And thank you, Addie. I just want to highlight for folks who may not know um, that when we were in the midst of a potential uh, eviction from our motels in the middle of winter of people who were experiencing homelessness um, during the pandemic, uh, the governor used the excuse that the motels no longer wanted to house people. And Addie worked to reach out with probably a lot of other amazing young people to motel owners across the state and found over 50 who were willing to sign their names to a letter saying that's dead wrong. Um, and so the power of an individual like Addie should not be lost on folks. And I just want to applaud you. 
Um, so, you know, for those of you who may not know me, uh, I co-chair the Social Equity Caucus. My life's work has been around racial justice. Um, I want to go back to the exact questions because sometimes I can go, you know, in a million different directions, but I'll start with the school to prison pipeline. When I first introduced legislation in 2014 to stop the expulsion of children under eight, it was to look overall at reducing the use of school exclusion for young people, but I asked, could we please stop expelling kids under eight? And I was told by leadership and other stakeholders in the legislature, this is never gonna happen. I was essentially laughed out of the building. So when Senator Sears approached me again, our chair of judiciary, um, to reintroduce the concept as a study once again in 2021, you know, I said, it is now 2021 and we should not be expelling children under eight years old, which we know deeply impacts uh, kids of color and kids with disabilities. And, you know, Senator Sears said, okay, that, that makes sense to me. So I, we reintroduced the bill, not expelling kids under eight, and our House and Senate Education Committee said, why are we suspending kids under eight? And so, you know, there was a sea change, and I often say it took a predator in the White House and a black man being killed for nine and a half minutes and having that rebroadcast over and over on national television for us to wake up to these realities and think about racial justice as an imperative for all of us. And it can't take those same things again for us to stay engaged in this conversation and make sure that we think about those who are otherwise most marginalized and most left behind. Uh, I just got up on the Senate floor and was the lone no vote to not water down the bill to end qualified immunity because I know what it's like to be arrested at the age of 13 by the LAPD and be asked, are you Mexican? Are you sure you're not Mexican? And then have my humanity stolen by being handcuffed to a bench for most of the night without anyone calling my parents or an attorney. This is what young kids of color face. And it's not just it by the LAPD. We know that in Chittenden County, young black men make up two and a half percent of the, of the county's population and 25% of those charged as youthful offenders. 10 times their representation in the population. So thank you, Addie, for all of your work. And I hope these kinds of figures will sink in for people. And I hope you will demand change so that we can be a more welcoming and safe state for everyone. Thank you very much for your response, um, Senator. Um, Lieutenant Governor Gray. Addie, thank you so much for your leadership and for being here this evening and for this extremely important question. Uh, I did want to recognize at the beginning, you mentioned the FEMA match program for the hotel motel program that is going to expire. And I think it's incumbent upon us as a state to demand that it be extended. We do not have housing in Vermont that's affordable that a voucher could possibly pay for uh, that's even available. So. Um, we're going to continue to need your leadership. So keep pushing, keep asking, and keep demanding that we do more because we have to do more. Across Vermont, be it in healthcare, be it in education, be it in public safety, um, be it in access to housing or economic opportunity or even government participation, we know that systemic racism exists and continues to exist. So not only do we have in ability, but we have an absolute obligation to do everything we can to root out systemic racism in all of its forms in our communities here in Vermont, but also nationally. I do wanna bring it back to housing for a moment because one piece of legislation that without question I would uh, support out of the gate is Senator Warnock's bill, the LIFT Act, which would ensure that first generation home buyers have tremendous support to access a home to buy a home, where in housing, as we know, we've seen systemic racism um, create barriers for black and brown Americans um, for centuries in, in owning homes. So it's just one example um, in light of the time, but I think it's an important one. And again, thank you for all your leadership um, and keep it up. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Um, Senator Ballant. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate the question, Addie. Nice to see you. Let's start with the rot, shall we? Let's start with the ugly truth, which is that institutional racism and white supremacy have been baked into our nation's history and culture, locking out many people of color for over 400 years. So it's going to take a lot of work over many, many years to fully dismantle it. 
And we can get to the policy prescriptions in a minute. But we also have to acknowledge that apart from the work that we do legislatively, apart from the work that we do in Congress, we have so much work that we need to do right here, right now in our communities in Vermont. Because there are many, many Vermonters who believe that racism is a thing of the past. That once we elected Barack Obama, all the racism in the country went away because we were post-racial. And it's difficult to have those conversations with our neighbors to say, not only is it still here, so many of our systems have been built upon it. And that's very difficult for so many good hearted people to hear. They don't know how to approach the issue. So we've got to do it, not just legislatively, but we have to be willing to have those hard conversations. So the work that we need to do legislatively, we need to do all that we can to end mass incarceration in this country. America is living proof that putting 2 million people in prison doesn't make us safer, doesn't make families healthier, doesn't in fact help communities, but in fact continues trauma. And we have to acknowledge that the criminal justice system was put in place in large part to control people of color and the poor. We also have to address the wealth gap. We've got to cancel student debt. We need to make sure that debt is not being canceled for people who otherwise could pay it. We need to make sure that cancel debt is going for com to communities who absolutely need the economic supports. And why do they need the economic supports? Because of things that we put in place decades ago that are now impacting their ability to accumulate wealth. And I know my time is up, but I have many more things to say, but I will, I will, uh, I will abide by the time constraints, so. Grateful for you. Thank you very much, Senator Ballot. Much appreciated. Um, and then our final rem, um, final respondent is um, Sinead. Patty, what a question. Um, listen, I, I, there are there are so there are so many things so many things to say here. You know. We're, we're not just talking about years of racial inequity, we're talking about centuries, and it's not just various systems of, of racism, we're talking about the entire foundation of our nation. Um, and so racism is embedded in every single part of our lives, particularly for Black folks, particularly for people of color. It affects every single interaction we have. And so it's it's an incredibly important, and there's there's so many different ways to approach this question. Um, but because of the time constraints, I I will pick the I'll pick the education piece because it's particularly close to my heart. Um, I grew up as a black kid through Vermont public schools. I know exactly what it's like to be a black kid and experience racism in our schools. It is not kind. It is not fun. It is not quiet. And I've heard too many stories like mine since I have left these schools. The stories and the research align Black students, Indigenous students, students of color, queer, trans, non-binary students, students with disabilities, and especially the students at the intersection of those identities experience disproportionate punishment and interactions and disproportionate interactions with law enforcement in school. I was lucky to have a couple of guardian angels in my life that helps me make it over the finish line, but luck shouldn't determine whether or not our schools are embracing students with love and care. Luck should have nothing to do with it. And that's why I am incredibly proud of my work on federal legislation, including the Ending Pushout Act and the Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act. Both, is, both are federal pieces of legislation that would provide anti-racist, trauma-responsive supports to schools while addressing root causes of harm, uh, harmful behavior towards students, particularly taking COPS, COPS funding, funding in the COPS bill, it's, that's the acronym, COPS, um, out of paying for police officers in school and making sure that schools have the adequate ratio of social workers, school, school psychologists, nurses, and guidance counselors in schools. Um, you know, there's there's so much there's so much more to say about this, but we cannot address inequality until we address how our students move through education and also cancel cancel student debt. 
Thank you for that. So um, we are now at our final question. So we are going to our opportunity for our final remarks from each of the candidates. So we're going to run a little bit long, but I think it will be right on time. So um, up first, I have, um, we'd love to hear from Lieutenant Governor Gray, your final remarks. Each person will have two minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kaya. And thank you, Rights and Democracy. Thank you, everyone here tonight. I think there's 173 participants on the Zoom, and I know a lot of people watching at home. The stakes in this election are extremely high. We haven't had an open congressional seat in Vermont since 2006. I think twice in the last century, we've had an open House and Senate seat. We have to elect someone who is ready to get to work for Vermont on day one. There is no time to waste on meeting the constituent needs, the diverse constituent needs that we've talked about tonight, be it social security benefits and re reforming and um, SSDI and SSI, meeting the needs of our veterans and our farmers, of our older Vermonters and our working families and our unions. We have so much work to do to deliver for the state. I'm the only candidate in this race that has a half decade of experience working in and with Congress and will be ready to get to work on day one. But Republicans nationally are looking at Vermont and thinking this is a small media buy, an extremely popular Republican governor, and they can pick up this seat. I'm also the only, only candidate who's run and won statewide. I beat the former pro tem in a very crowded primary. I beat a self-funded millionaire, a self-funded campaign uh, by a Bitcoin millionaire when Republicans put over $300,000 into our small state. We can't take this seat for granted. We can't take this race for granted. I hope to earn your support to work with you day in and day out for our collective needs and to make sure that we're sending a Democrat to Washington in November. Thank you again for having me tonight and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, thank you for your remarks. Um, Shanae. I, again, I am I'm so grateful to be in virtual community with you all and to have had this opportunity to share with you all. Um, in my experience as, as a social worker, as someone who has worked on legislation that has come out of one of the most progressive offices on the house right now, um, I know how incredibly difficult it is to I know how incredibly difficult it is to take what are big ideas, but actually translate them into concrete policy and do the hard work of, of not backing away from, from legislation because it's hard or it's difficult to do, but actually digging in and talking to folks who are advocates nationally um, in the disability rights space and talking to students all across the nation about their experiences with push out so we could make better legislation. Um, we 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 can do we can do hard things but we cannot individualize our way out of collective and communal crisis i believe that we can have a future to be hopeful about but with so much at stake we have to have people who are bold enough and brave enough to fight for structural solutions to structural change to structural challenges um our our choices are it's it's less that our, our choices are not politically possible, but we need folks who, at the end of the day, will no matter what, choose working families. Um, and as as you get to know me a little bit through this through this process, know that if there's if there's one thing I'm gonna do, it's I'm gonna end with a poem. So I'll I'll close with the words of Gwendolyn Brooks, the last line from her tribute to Paul Robeson: um, "We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business." We are each other's magnitude and bond. So thank you, and you have all my love. Thank you very much, Shanae. Um, Senator Ballant. So here we are with an open congressional seat, and the stakes have never been higher for Vermont or for the nation. The cost of housing is spiraling out of control, the cost of healthcare is outrageous. And all of this is happening while we try to grapple with a climate crisis, deep economic inequality and racial injustice. These huge problems threaten the future of all of our children and our grandchildren, including my own kids. And as a gay Vermonter, I can tell you, 
I never thought I'd be able to legally marry my spouse. And I mention it because Vermont has at times been the conscience of the nation. Not perfect, not without missteps, but we have tried. We have tried in some moments to bend towards justice, towards a more equitable future. What this moment needs right now is Vermont to lead once again with a person of integrity, with the skills to do the hard work in the quiet rooms long after hours, someone who can build coalitions to deliver lasting change, and someone who has shown a true commitment to service as a teacher, as a mom, as the president pro tem of the Senate. That is who I am. That is who I've always been and that is who I will be. And in this race, I have the strongest record to prove it. I have always led with my values, have always remained rooted in what will move us all forward and have been able to build unlikely coalitions to deliver for working people over and over again. I am an optimist rooted in reality and I will work as hard as I possibly can to deliver for all of you, to fight for justice and equity for all. Thank you very much, Senator Valens. Um, and finally, Senator Ram Hinsdo. Thank you, Kaya. And thank you again so much to our, our folks listening and to RAD for organizing this incredible forum. You know, listen, folks, I don't do the work in the quiet rooms after hours. I do the work on the state house steps with you. I do the work in the streets. I do the work side by side with working Vermonters and people struggling to get by. And that's where the work needs to be done. I got into the legislature after traveling to mobile home communities around the state, meeting with new American folks, going out to talk to migrant farm workers and indigenous people about environmental health issues that they were facing, about having a lack of access to clean drinking water, about not having materials about their rights in their own language. I introduced the first environmental justice bill in 2007 when I was still a senior at UVM and had not been elected to the legislature. And that same environmental justice bill, though thankfully, uh, made better by a lot of folks in the BIPOC affinity space, particularly through RAD, is going to pass on the Senate floor this week, 16 years later. I have been doing the work and making sure that I would do it alongside all of you, and it makes our legislation better for it. And I will not walk away from the negotiating table empty-handed. So much legislation that I've worked on for a decade in the legislature is finally coming to pass because we have met the moment and we have turned it into a movement. And that is exactly what I'm asking to do with all of you. And that is exactly the opportunity we have in this election. I am someone who can dream big and also deliver on those bold promises. And the only way I can do that is with you and together with labor leaders and climate leaders who have already endorsed this campaign, we will take Washington by storm. And I promise you, if you elect the daughter of immigrants, a woman of color from a rural white state like Vermont, Washington will be talking about it. So I ask you to join us and I ask for your support so that together we can make that dream a reality and deliver for Vermonters. Thank you. Wow, what an incredible discussion. Thank you so much, Senator Hinsdale. Um, a huge thank you to each of the candidates for joining us today and for each of you in participating in today's event. RAD members, again, will be participating in an endorsement vote later this spring, and we'd love for you all to be able to take part. So you can take part of that by becoming a member today. So we're going to drop a link in the chat that you'll be able to click on and learn about more of what, member what membership means and how you can become a part of this movement. So be sure to visit Rights and Democracy on our website. We are everywhere you are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and more for all events and information. Stay safe and healthy out there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and together we win. Good night.